I want you to know um, how much I uh, respect your pastor. This might be the fifth time my wife has ever seen me in a suit. So, and I don't want any of the uh, old timers here to get nervous. I didn't uh, walk into Kerry Gordon's church without a Bible. I have it on my iPad, all right? I said to Amy, I said, you know, we didn't bring our Bibles here. People are going to think, what the heck's he going to say? I said, well, I guess I got it on my iPad, so it'll be okay. Um, I'm going to do something today that uh, you guys are sort of used to because uh, your pastor sort of did this last year uh, when when he stood up and and defied the IRS and and said, you will not tell me what I'm going to say, uh, that that I'm going to say what God wants me to say, that I am not regulated by you, but I am regulated by God. And how much different would our culture be if we could get even just a few dozen pastors in Iowa to do the exact same thing. And then in the states around us, in the states around us, this country would be a lot different. If pastors in the last generation or two as a whole would have done that, this country would be a lot different and our civilization would be a lot different than it is today. So with his leading, I'm going to do something today that they say you're not supposed to do in church. But given the gravity of the moment, I'm going to do it anyway. If you ever listen to me on the radio, I don't tend to follow everybody else's rules anyway, so I think you guys will be okay with that. What I'm going to do today is um, I'm going to endorse a candidate. Yeah, when I did this at my church, same thing happened. It got real quiet real quick. (laughs) Um, This is a big election. We have a big election that is coming up. We are a civilization that is in flux. You look at your economy, we are debt-ridden. We have a very large government that we are using to fund not just excess but corruption, welfare, social programs that do not work, that enable immorality. Our law, our law, in fact, advocates for immorality. The laws made by your Senate, for example, they advocate immorality. We have little regard for the sanctity of human life in this culture. And what's happening now is these these influences in the culture at large are now beginning to squeeze, to to sort of hone in on our sanctuary here. And there's been times in the past when we've seen the world at large has tried to invade our sanctuaries and we have fought back. And now this is again one of those times. Because what happens is when the state, when Caesar says, when Caesar says something is good, The people who don't know any better tend to believe that, tend to go along with what Caesar has to say. We are a people with a providential history, a special history that no one else in the world can claim. And we have been used as a light to all the nations. And therefore, it is our responsibility to protect that which God has given and blessed only to us. Correct? That's why we don't have time. We're running out of time as a people. You don't have several generations now. This is not going to be a 50-year or 100-year battle to get your country back. We won't get it overnight, but if we don't take one very big step right away, there won't be anything left to fight for in 50 years. That's why we have to do something now. Right now. And I'm going to tell you what I think you have to do. I'm good at that. Well, I think I'm good at that. God and I haven't settled that argument or not yet. I know he's called, to, he's called me to speak. I don't know if he's called me to tell you what to do. We're still negotiating that part of the equation. Here's what you need to do in this next election. Are you ready? I'm going to tell you who you have to vote for here. Write this down, please. Barabbas. I need you to vote for Barabbas. He's not perfect, but he's better. He's not good, but he's better. He's a little personally, morally compromised. You know, maybe sometimes, you know, he's kind of taking that you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs thing a little too far. But he's better. He'll fight for your history. He'll fight for your country. 
He'll fight for your traditions. He'll fight for your flag. And you got all these other people out there. I know some of you in this audience are saying, well, you know, what about this other group that's out there talking about holiness? And, you know, it's not what come, goes into your mouth that makes you unholy, but what comes out. What about all these other people that think, you know, you ought to live up to the same standard you demand of other people? What about that? Listen, if you guys want to ponder the lint in your navel, feel free. Our country's about to run out of time. We don't have time for that. That's why when that election is held here very soon, I need you to go down to that place and I need you to vote for Barabbas, a real patriot. Let me take the tongue out of my cheek here for a second. You know, all the arguments that I just made about where our country is at were applicable in Jesus' time but where his was too. And about the only example, I'm not a theologian, I'm just kind of a video game geek that's read the Bible too many times. But the only example of voting I can find in the scriptures is the scene I just laid out. And those people who welcomed him with palm branches the previous few days then go down and scream what? Crucify him. Give us, give us a patriot. Give us somebody who will do something now. This scene is not unique in your Bible. God's people go to the judge, the last of the judges, Samuel, and they say, give us a king so we can be like everybody else. And so God gives them a king. He looks like he's out of central casting. He's strapping. He has the right look. And he's a coward. And he's vindictive. And he's double-minded. So he gave them a king like everybody else. I don't know about the rest of you. I am tired of voting for Barabbas. Better is not good. There might be two people that try to break into your home. One will shoot your kneecap off. The other will slit your throat. I suppose getting your kneecap shot off is better than having your throat slit. But might we agree it's not good. <laughs> the reason we have elections in this country is so that God gives you the option to take the gun away from the guy that will shoot your kneecap off and shoot the guy that will slit your throat with it first. That's the point of this. Better is not good. My wife, whom I adore, she says something every once in a while to me that compliments me, and it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. When I feel like I haven't done what I'm supposed to do in terms of time with the kids, or maybe I lost my temper with them, and I really get down on myself because I grew up in a very abusive background, so I'm very sensitive to this. Very sensitive. I don't want to be like the dad that raised me. And you know, until Jesus came into my life, I so focused on not being like him that guess what I became like? Him. I needed to put my mindset on something else, like the gentleman who spoke before me. What I thought about all day long and the way I thought about it, I eventually became. And so until Jesus gave me a new matrix, something else to think of, I was becoming exactly like that, which I didn't want to become. And so I'm very sensitive to this. And my wife will say to me, listen, you're still a lot better than a lot of the fathers out there that I see. And I know that she is trying to give me a helmet sticker, pick me up, and I adore her for that. But we live in a culture where 70% of the babies in the black community are born without a father. 45% of the babies in the Hispanic community are born without a father. A third of the babies across the country born without a father. 45% fatherlessness in this culture. Might I suggest I might be better, but that's not good. That's not good. One of the things I hear people say, hey, I'm just looking for who can beat Obama. Wow, what a great standard that is. <laughs> what a standard that is. I mean, somebody needs to get a bar of soap and shove it in somebody's mouth when you hear them say that. Imagine, ladies, imagine a man comes to court you. You're not all that impressed, but he says, hey, the guy who's the worst person in town, I'm better than him. Do you want to go out? That's not much of a line, is it? 
Moms might tell you, raise your standards just a little bit. Just a little bit. Hey, I think, listen, I'm just looking for whoever's better than the most unconstitutional, un-American, pagan president this country's ever elected. That's what I'm looking for. Well, that's what you'll get. That is what you will get. You will get the leaders that you deserve. For God will not be mocked. A man will always reap what he sows. You would think in a state like Iowa, we'd understand principles like sowing and reaping pretty well. You sow compromise into the ground that is the harvest that you will reap. And we have done this many, many times. We've done this for generations. Now, I'm not saying I want to be like Dr. Phil, but I'm going to borrow one of his lines. How's that working out for you? How's that working for you? Now, there's one mistake we keep making as to why we get better and not good. And what is better anyway? What's better anyway? What's more evil? The one who says, I'm evil. And if you elect me, evil is what I will do. Or the guy who verbally assents to good and righteousness, but then his record says not so much. What's better? You know, if this was a boxing match, you know, I can fight back against the Nancy Pelosi's and Mike Gronstall's of the world. We, you know, they they ring the bell. We go out into the ring. I see them head on. I can defend myself against the wolf. Jesus didn't warn me against the wolf. What did he warn me against? the wolf in sheep's clothing. And then when the bell rings, I'm supposed to go back to my corner and get freshened up. And I got people like John McCain shanking me in the side. I can't defend myself against that. That's the problem. Even pagans, even pagan philosophers understood the enemy in the gate is the worst of them all. And here's what's even the worst of that. We're empowering these people, ladies and gentlemen. Why are we doing this? I'll tell you why. I know the answer because I've talked to more audiences like this than probably almost anybody in the state of Iowa has for the last five years. And there are two things I have seen across the board. I don't care what your theological traditions and convictions are. There's two things that unite Christendom in this state and maybe across the country. I can't say I haven't been across the country. I've only spoken to Iowans. Let me tell you what number one is. Fear. Fear. I see fear all the time. What will they say about me? Will I lose my job? Will I lose that friend? Will 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 they not give me a donation? Will they not come to my church? Fear, fear, fear. Fear Fear-based activism. Fear-based philosophy. Fear-based behavior. And that comes from number two. A lack of the understanding of the sovereignty of God. You know, a lot of you think this is about right versus left. Might I submit it's not. This is about right versus wrong. That's what this is about. And right is an absolute standard just as much as wrong is. And your babies aren't any less dead because the Republicans killed them or funded them. The institution of, this fam- of the family in this country isn't any less destroyed because the Republicans did nothing to stop them from doing so. Either God is or he isn't. I have discovered, God has shown me there's really only two worldviews here. Really only two. And it's not Christianity and Islam or conservatism and liberalism. It's not any of those things. I'll just give you the two. Either God is or he isn't. That's it. And in that isn't, you're going to get conservatism at times and liberalism and Islam and all kinds of heinous sects of people purporting to be Christianity, but they all got one thing in common, and what is that? That God isn't. They all agree on that. They all agree on that. But Steve, Steve, shouldn't we build consensuses and coalitions? You know, the early church was faced with this temptation. Caesar came along and he said, Kaiser Curious, which means what? Caesar is Lord. And the Christian said, no. Christos curious, which means what? Jesus is Lord. And Caesar, of course, being liberal and tolerant, said, all right, you know, just give a donation to the local unifaith 
alliance and we'll let it go. Is that what Caesar said? No, he killed those Christians for that. See, your church fathers, they weren't murdered for worshiping Jesus. They were, wor- they were murdered for only worshiping Jesus. And that, friends, is the difference. Something supernatural happens when our faithfulness, as imperfect as we are, let me tell you a little bit about me. I was born to a 15-year-old mom who was 14 when she conceived me. Roe versus Wade comes down the pike. Should we abort him? Should we not? Unlike several of her friends, she decides to keep her kid, and here I am. I'm, third, I'm going to be 38 years old next month. And my father, my, the stepdad that raised me, you know, sometimes we'd get beat because it was Tuesday. You'd hear his Ram Charger coming down the street, and you just waited. We'd be playing basketball in my driveway. We'd wait, find out what kind of day he had at work. If it was a good day, he'd park at the end of the drive, come and say hi, and be a great guy. If it wasn't, he'd drive right underneath the basketball hoop as we were playing, and you better get out of the way. My friends knew it was time to leave. I knew it was time to go to the basement because who knew what the rest of the day was going to be like? I met my wife on the internet, and let's just say this is before the days of eHarmony. <laughs> let's say that it was one of those kind of pagan chat rooms where if you can't score in this chat room, then more than likely Bob Barker's talking to you when he talks about getting spayed and neutered. It's just not happening for you. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure she's paying attention down there. <laughs> if, if, if God would have said to me, hey, you may think you're getting over right now. Let me show you what 10 years from now looks like, and you're going to stand in rooms like this. I'd have run, get thee to a nunnery, Shakespeare once said. I'd ran as fast away from that as I possibly could have. This is not the plan I had. I was going to be some kind of cross between Jim Rome and Rush Limbaugh. That's what I was going to be. This is not what I had in mind. When we brought our firstborn, who's down the hill here at your Sunday school, we brought her home. We lived in this little crummy apartment, two bedrooms. The second bedroom is, was my little den where I kept my video game system and my really cool porn stash. But we had no other space in the apartment, so that's also where we had to put Anna's crib. That's who I am. I'm not a good guy. I'm a different guy. And that's the difference. So I want you to know that about me so that I don't stand up here. I'm not Mr. Know-it-all. Amy put a sign. We homeschool. She put a sign in our classroom for the kids, and it says, quick, get out now while you know everything. <laughs> All right? So I don't want to stand here as some guy who's got a, you know, a 10-year-old, a 6-year-old, and a 4-year-old, and I know everything. I don't. I want you to know my background. I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy that God saved. That's all I am. That's all I am, all right? And I, and I may be a guy that God saved, and, and one thing he has taught me and that I have learned is something downright supernatural happens when our faithfulness meets his sovereignty. I can't explain it. Theologians across the spectrum of orthodoxy have debated what is the limits of our faithfulness in God's sovereignty. Where does one begin? Where does one end? I didn't come here to settle that argument today, although I certainly have some opinions. See me after the church service. I'll give you a few if you want. But really, it's what's, the, what's the most important thing is what happens when those two things meet. And let me tell you what happens when those two things meet. When those two things meet, we stop trying to regulate slavery out of business and we abolish it. That's what happens. And you will not end the scourge of abortion which nearly claimed my life, the life of my wife and her own mother who were part of those so-called exceptions all these really pro-life politicians proudly tell you that they will allow while calling themselves pro-life. Well, they would exception themselves and exception me right out of a family if we listen to them. And those three children that are down the hill wouldn't be alive if we listen to those pro-life with exceptions folks that sign those pledges and then slap themselves that little pro-life brownie button on their lapel like they're a real tough guy. (laughs) And they're not. Imagine if the civil rights activists of the 50s and 60s said, all right, let me just tell you right now, all right? Listen, the person who is my, uh, you know, 80% 
a, a equal opportunity isn't my 20% lyncher. So five days out of the week, you guys treat us, treat we black folks like we're just like everybody else. But the other two days out of the week, because we'll compromise on this principle of equality and all, you treat us like we're three-fifths of a human still. How's that? We'll go for that. Could they win that way? Do you win a moral battle sacrificing the moral high ground of your argument ever? What if your pastor stood up and said, you know what, Jesus is Lord of all except for like 99.99%, but that's better than nothing. That's better. Better sometimes is the enemy of the good. We do not recognize the sovereignty of God in what we do. I got a lot of things wrong when I was on the radio. I used to tell people, man, I sleep like a Calvinist at night that I'm doing what God wants me to do, and I sleep like an Arminian that I'm doing it the way God wants me to do it. <laughs> All right? I mean, I was a lot more sure of what God wanted me to do than the way I was going about it. But let me tell you, there's one thing. Humbly, I will stand here in your pastor's pulpit and say this under direct accountability from God himself. One thing I did get right is that I recognized that God was in charge always. Open your Bibles. That's right. I once was listening to a Christian radio program, and I heard the host, a woman, say on the, on the program, she said, you know, you've got to call your congressman, you've got to call your senator, you've got to get them involved. We can't let this happen. It was an issue of moral importance. And she was really exhorting her listeners to, to get on the phone and to do something. And then she went like this, and she said, but... We know in this Laodicean age of the church that things will only get worse. And I'm driving in my car and I just wish I could have jumped through the radio as I listened to this. You ever tried to drive a car hitting the gas and the brake at the same time? <laughs> Do you go anywhere? And I don't care what your eschatological persuasion is, but either God is in control or he's not. Even if you have the dimmest view of the church and history going into the future, God still must be sovereign to orchestrate those events to their culmination, must he not? Do not tell people to go fight and then say you won't win. That actually violates the Christian doctrine of a just war. We don't, that's called a slaughter, not a war. And if you were listening to that, you're the mom and you're at home and I got to pick my kids up from school or I'm homeschooling them and, you know, my husband wants dinner when he gets home from work and I'm listening, I'm going to get all involved and then she says it won't make a difference anyway, I'm going to probably put the phone down and not do a darn thing. We do this all the time. You believe you will lose. And therefore, because you believe you will lose, you do not recognize the sovereignty of God. All of these compromises make sense to you. They make perfect sense to get the best deal you can get. Makes perfect sense to vote for Barabbas unless there's a Jesus. But Steve, Jesus is on the ballot. Brother, he is always on the ballot. Can I get a witness on that? He is on the ballot no matter where you're at. He's on the ballot when you're on your computer at night and your wife and kids are in bed. He is on the ballot when nobody's watching you. He's on the ballot with the way you treat your wife and children, the way that you perform your job. He's always on the ballot. Every decision we make is a theological one. So, Steve, are you saying that you want a theocracy? We already have one. Every government in human history has been a theocracy. The only debate is who's Theo. That's the debate. Every government's a theocracy. Read through the Old Testament. Several of those kings called themselves Baal, followed by a name. What does Baal mean? Lord! The whole argument that started this country, the divine rights of kings, from their lips to God's ears. Every government is a theocracy. It's just a matter of who God is in this case. See, a lot of you go into the voting booth, you think you're determining the outcome, and in a way you are, but brother and sister, not in the way you think. This is not a choose-your-own-adventure book. I read those when I was a kid, loved them. Anybody else? Gotta love the 80s. I used to read those when I was a kid, except I was the kid that skipped to the back of the book to make sure I chose the right solution. I don't like to lose, all right? I don't like to lose. So me taking this really principled stand, it goes against my nature. I'm the kind of guy that finds a way to win all the time. I hate losing. 
My kids will tell you, if they beat me at Candyland at home, they are cabbage patching because daddy doesn't let them win anything. <laughs> so you know this message is from God because Steve will find a way to cheat to win. That's how I roll, all right? But when you go into that voting booth, you are determining the outcome. But you know, this isn't a choose your own adventure book. You know, God, it's like, it, it, God's not like, oh, snap, what will we do if they choose wrong? <laughs> I guess we'll reboot the whole thing. I, I, I once got a whole bunch of emails one day when that liberal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco ruled that God is not in the Pledge of Allegiance anymore. Steve, they took God out. They took God out. I wrote him back. I was like, wow, if only he had seen that coming. <laughs> How stupid and asinine does this sound when we actually verbalize what we think sometimes? You almost have to laugh, otherwise you'll sink your head, you'll do a face palm. When we get that? It was like God just set up there, right? They just, and they had a brainstorming session. I call all the angels, call the host together. The, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals took us out of the United States of America. We're going to have to regroup and rethink this, man. We've been, we've been defeated here. This isn't Survivor, where human governments outwit and outlast and outplay God. doesn't work that way. And when you play along with them, you're on the losing team. So you are choosing your leaders. And if you want to know why they're better and not good, we then probably need to look in the mirror. Because we will get the leaders we deserve. God gave the Israelites, when, they, when he said to Samuel, brother, do not be worried. They have not turned their back on you. Who did he say they turned their back on? Me. Me. Jesus says to Saul on the road to Damascus, why are you persecuting those oppressed minority Christians? Is that what he said? He said, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And so when they turned their backs on God, God gave them a king that was a perfect manifestation of the spiritual condition of the people. Your leaders are the same. You will very seldom get a Winston Churchill. I'm, not a, I'm a bit of a student of history. In my humble opinion, maybe the only leader in Western civilization in the last century that transcended his culture was Winston Churchill. Meaning he was better than the culture that gave birth to him. And by the way, how did those, just to prove that point, how did those people repay him after he saved their civilization? What did they do next? They yanked him out of office. They voted him out. Some, some of you might bristle and say, what about Ronald Reagan? Ronald Reagan was part of a generation. He actually represented his generation. Just the two generations since his, we are deteriorating as a people. And so your leaders are going to be an example of this. They will mirror your own moral compromises. They will mirror your fears. They will, mi they will mirror your double-mindedness. And if it seems like we're unstable as a, situation, as, as a civilization, well, the double-minded man is what? unstable in all of his ways. We've got to take this back to basics. When you go to vote, just like when you do everything else, it is an act of worship, faithfulness, obedience. Faithfulness, what is that? Long obedience in the same direction, consistency. That's what that is. We don't have to be perfect. People always accuse me of looking for perfection. My wife loves me, but if you think I'm perfect, see her after the show, okay? She'll tell you I am not perfection. But you know what I think she will tell you? I think she will tell you, and the fact she's here today I think speaks to that. I think she will tell you I'm, I do strive to be consistent. And when I'm inconsistent, that I will admit, sometimes it takes longer than others, but I will admit when I have been so. What we're looking for is the word here. There's, there's another word that just came to mind. Let me write this up on the board, if you will. Because I think this is a word that, in my opinion, is the number one thing you are looking for in your leaders, whether they be in your families, in your homes, in your churches, or in your government. And it's this word right here. Integrity. What is integrity? A consistency between belief and behavior, that's what it is. A consistency between the belief and the behavior. The biggest mistake we have made is not in our ideology. You ask the right questions 
when you vet your candidates? Are you pro-life? What do you think a marriage is? Is the government too big? Where does law come from? And tonight we're going to look at these questions a little bit more in depth. And I saved that talk on purpose because there's going to be a presidential candidate here tonight. I want her to hear some of this. So we'll get to what those questions and those answers look like. But let's get to those questions here for just a second. You ask the right ideological questions. You're trying to find out what they believe, right? And those are good questions to ask. How many of you are teachers in this room? You've heard of teaching to the test, right? And this is what they do nowadays. This is where we don't necessarily teach kids critical thinking anymore in our government school systems. We inculcate them, or I might say indoctrinate them, into either a worldview or to get enough right answers to get the right score on a test. It's called teaching to the test. A lot of your conservative or Christian advocacy organizations have done the same thing. And what happens is they've essentially coached candidates on how to fool you people. Last year, one of my employees found out she, got, she intercepted an email. She intercepted an email from the Republican Party of Iowa literally telling conservative candidates how to answer the questionnaires to the Iowa Right to Life, the Iowa Christian Alliance, the National Rifle Association. It was literally an answer key. Question A, question 1A, 2B, how to answer they teach to the test. And so what happens is they get on the campaign trail, they say all the right things, and then they get into office and what happens? Like that old cereal commercial, nothing, honey. Nothing happens. Absolutely nothing. I suppose it's better. You know, I suppose those Californians that got IOUs from their government felt better about that last year because it came from Republican Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Right, I'm sure when their tax refunds and stuff didn't come in, they sat down at the dinner table and said, Honey, you know what? Boy, this really, this isn't any good. But hey, at least the Republican ripped us off. It just doesn't sting as much. <laughs> it should probably sting worse. Because they're the ones soliciting your worldview. The other side just totally turned their back on it. The other side's the book of Judges. And in those days, Israel had no king, so everyone does as he or she sees fit. Sometimes you can almost negotiate with those people better. They're at least honest. It's the self-righteous. They're the worst. And so what happens is these candidates, and I'll tell you, I know a lot of them. I know a lot of them. Several of them I've helped. Most of them I've met or talked to. I've had access, more access, access to this system by the grace of God because of the job I've had than most of you have had. So let me tell you how the sausage is made. Are you ready? You may think you are. You're not. This is the sort of thing that when you know it, it's going to make you go home, get in the fetal position, have your wife rub your back and say, make the bad man stop, please. All right? So let me tell you how this works. There's two kinds of these candidates. Number one is the one who's a real, devout believer. And they have no foundation beyond that. They once got really sad about all the sin and evil stuff they did, and they walked an aisle and they answered, they answered a call. And they accepted Jesus into their hearts. And in their minds, that meant that Jesus was impotent and had no power in their lives at all until they stood up and said, wow, the sky's there. Okay, come on in. And therefore, they're now sovereign over their relationship with Jesus all the way through. They don't want babies murdered anymore. They want marriage sanctified. They want a government that is godly and righteous, but they're working against themselves. They work against themselves because they do not understand that hell is really hot and really forever. And they have no fear of God, and they lack wisdom, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. So they go down there with good intentions, and they get creamed. I have seen it time and time again. And one of three things happens. They totally drop out. They buy a farm somewhere out in rural Iowa and blog bitterly. <laughs> All right? Or, 
or they just give in. And if we just kill, we kill one less baby and steal one less dollar than the other side. Aren't we so good? And they become little Pharisees, self-righteous. You know, it's interesting Jesus says to that group, you know, you tithe on every ounce of spice, yet you reject the spirit of the law. But notice what he says later. He says, you should have done the former without rejecting the latter. He doesn't rip them for going over the, spirit, going over the letter of the law. He rips them because they've done it without the context of the spirit of it. They're doing it to glorify themselves, not God. And this is what I call works with faith as opposed to faith with works. We do what we want to do. We do what God wants us to do. I watched friends of mine, men who have been guests in my own home, that know my own life story and the story of my family. I watched them last week at this legislature go down there and vote to fund, have your money go to fund the killing of babies like my own wife and children. And this is why. Works with faith. I'm so much better than that what I'm going against. That I can make any compromise and we're just little utilitarians. If a little bit of goodness comes out, then gosh darn it, that's righteous and good enough for God. No, it's not. Because no one is good but God. And so if no one is good but God, then God decides, therefore, then what? What is good? Is that good? Thou shalt not murder. I must have met, I must have missed the codicils and the exceptions. Well, except on Tuesdays, or except if the Democrats have a majority, or except if the polls go against you, or except if somebody close to you had an abortion, then it's okay. Really? Is it? No, it's not. We're singing a lot of, a lot of songs today with the word holy in it. What does that mean? Complete. Set apart. Another translation of that word is peculiar. That's something else. A lot of these Christians you elect aren't peculiar, meaning they're really not any different than the people they're rolling with. That, my friend, is a problem. There's one thing, between, there's a difference between being relevant and being indistinguishable. There is a difference. There's a difference between in the world and not of it, but then being of the world and in it. And so they do works with faith. They do what they think is right, and then they stand up like Cain and say, God, bless my humanistic offering. That's what they do. They don't give God what he wants. They give God what they're willing to give him. And they, like a gerbil chasing a piece of cheese in a cage, they keep going after it over and over and over again, wondering why it never changes. They never quite get it. This is why. Then there's the other group. The other group isn't even mildly interested in what you believe. And because a lot of your so-called Christian political organizations are nothing other than a front and a facade for the Republican Party, they cover for these fools. And they, these groups, they used to go to these fools and tell them what you want from them. Now they come back to you and say, here's what they're willing to give you. I once had a friend of mine tell me, about one of the national figures, exactly that, one of the national figures in the religious right, who's been on my radio program before, he said, you know, this individual used to go to Washington and come back, and he would, he would, we, 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 we Southern Baptists would send him there, and he'd tell the politicians what we wanted. <laughs> now he's been there so long and been hanging with them so long and been to so many of their Christmas parties, he comes back and says to us what they're willing to give us. And these people have no interest in what you're interested in, they pay you lip service. They know your talking points. They know your language. And because you don't move beyond the ideology to the methodology, they get away with it all of the time. Barack Obama says, when he's asked by Rick Warren, hey, when's a baby entitled to human rights? One of the best questions anybody asked in this last presidential cycle. And he shrugs his shoulders and says, I don't know. That's above my pay grade. And we, we see the wolf. We see the fangs. We see the drool coming from his mouth. We recoil at that because we know how wickedly evil that cavalier answer was. That's above your pay grade? Dude, that is your pay grade. That's what you're there for. You are a civil magistrate. You are there to prosecute the law of God. You better know the answer to that question. And we see that and we know that is wicked. And then John McCain comes on screen and says, well, life begins at conception. But here's what he didn't tell you. Life begins at conception unless taxpayers want to fund embryonic stem cell research, then it doesn't. 
Life begins at conception unless you are conceived in a rape, incest, or life or health of the mother. Health of the mother just means, by the way, anybody can say anything and, I'll, and, and you can get an abortion. That's what it means. And he says it with conviction because he really means it. Because we're not doing guys like John McCain a favor. We have taught him that since he's maybe a little better than the most evil, wicked person that's ever ran for president in this country, that means he's good. And so we're helping him become more self-righteous. He doesn't have to meet God's standard. He just has to meet yours. Your standard, folks, isn't good. No one is good but God. How dare you believe you can negotiate that which God, pa God paid for at a high price? You are not your own. You were redeemed at a high price. You want to know why I avoided these things at WHO? I had plenty of other issues. But here's why. Because I recognized that it, for me it wasn't a question of will I compromise. It was a question of can I compromise? There may be a woman in this room I'm very attracted to. I suppose I could, and maybe she would be attracted to me. I suppose I could wrestle with the question, will I cheat on my wife with her? Will I? Or then I count the cost and recognize I have no right to and ask a different question, can I? Can I? See, can I is permission. Will I is different. That's a question. One's a question of the will. The other's a question of obedience. And those are different. Martin Luther once wrote a book, Bondage of the Will, that answered this question. Your will is bad. The reason we fall, I do this too. You want to know when I fall morally? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you when it happens. It's probably the same thing that happens to you. I fall morally when I ask myself the question, will I do this? And I wrestle with it, and I wring my hands. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to look. And then I look. I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to do it again. And then I do it again. Do not leave me up here hanging. I know I'm not the only one that does this. <laughs> it's a question of, will I talk to my kids like that? Will I look at that on the computer again? Will I use that kind of language? Will I make that moral compromise? No. The question, friends, is can I? Can I? And that's when the Holy Spirit says, no, you may not. You do not belong to you. You belong to me. I paid for that. Someone may drive me off the road. I may think to myself, man, will I go and hunt that guy down, give him the one finger salute and a knuckle sandwich? <laughs> and then I think to myself, well, here's what happens if I do that. They have a thing called prison, right? Then they'll blog about me. That's the worst thing I've ever, okay? And suddenly I start counting the cost and I realize I can't do this. Can is a question of permission and obedience. Will is a question of willfulness. Your politicians, too many of them, they go down to the state house, they go to capitals, they go to white houses, and they ask, will I do this? Will I give in to the media? Will I give in? Not can I. I don't know about you, but whenever I've watched a politician take the oath of office, he's never, had, never said, so help me the liberal media. Never said, so help me a Supreme Court opinion. Never said, so help me popular opinion. What does he say? So help me God. Do not trifle with the name of God. Amy will tell you, I never, that's a tough word to use in church, I'm going to use it, I never came home wondering at night, man, am I going to give in and make this moral compromise? I never did. Never. Doesn't mean I don't have struggles. I have plenty of them. That's another message and someone else will give that one. All right, I have plenty of struggles, but on, these, on this question, will I do what the masses want? See, I began with this premise. God is sovereign. He gave me this opportunity. I never even applied for a radio job in my life. I've done more work to get on the air during the last six months than I ever did the previous 10 years. Literally, people called me up and said, do you want to be on the radio? Are you going to pay me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that is the God's honest truth. I wouldn't know how to get a radio job. I figured that out the last few months. I'm like, snap, I work for one of the best stations in the country. I don't know how to get on the air anywhere else. It took me months to figure it out. Somehow, some way, this is what God had planned for my life, and he's got a plan for you too. 
And when your obedience meets his sovereignty, you will see it manifested in your life. One of the state senators that's going to be here tonight is one of my best friends. And I'll tell you, he's not perfect. He might have rougher rougher edges than even I do. God love him. But at least I get to say I'm better than him, right? Wrong. (laughs) But the one thing I can tell you, because I know him about as well as I know anybody I'm not related to. And I think he'd say the same thing about me. The one thing I can tell you is this question he gets right. This one he gets right. He doesn't make compromises because he knows he can't. I can't. You're, it, it, so please don't be offended. You're not asking. It, it's not that I won't give you something. It's that I can't. I can't give that to you. And that's where we need to draw these lines. You look at the ideology of the candidate. You look at what they say they believe. And they may even articulate, articulate it well. Because in their hearts they believe it. And in their self-righteous hearts they think because I believe this and the other guy doesn't, I'm better. No, you're not. Because it's not works with faith, it's faith with what? Works. Show me your life, show me the fruit. Jesus' followers came to him one day and said, how are we going to know who's on our team? How are we going to know who you sent? And what does Jesus say? By their fruit, you will know a tree by its fruit. And people say to me all the time, boy, you're harsh. Hey, I'm only looking at what you did. If abortion is murder, if abortion is murder and you voted to fund it, you are an accomplice therein. No matter what you state, you say you believe your actions. A famous theologian once said, listen, I can't get past your words because your actions are drowning them out. Preach the gospel, use words if necessary. You can tell me everything you want, but I'm just looking at what you do. I know men who lead Christian organizations in this state. And their wife and kids aren't anywhere to be found. Now, I don't know what the rest of the men in this room think, but that's an instant spidey sense tingling for me. When a man acts as if he's got a calling, and the wife and kids who see him with his knickers down and know him best aren't anywhere to be found when he's engaging it, ever? Not that they need a break, but they're never around? You've never even seen them? You don't know who they are? That is a major warning sign. Because they know him better than anybody else does. They've seen him naked figuratively and literally. They know what he's really about. And that's where the integrity comes from. Is there a consistency of belief and behavior? Now I have some bad news. As if the rest of this wasn't necessarily a banana split. (laughs) I have some bad news. The kinds of leaders that you normally, or that you really desire largely do not exist. They don't. And the reason why is because too many buildings like this one have been closed off to the Great Commission for at least a generation, if not two. Because we have taught people that if they feel real bad about their sins once, ask Jesus into their hearts, they can then go and live a nice little antinomian existence the rest of the way. That there's nothing else to do. That's it. That I can go on a 50,000 watt station and make all the compromises I need to make to get advertisers because if I don't, someone worse will come behind me. And then if I go to church on Sunday and ask Jesus to forgive me, then it's okay. Everything I did Monday through Saturday. And this has played out over and over and over again, this pattern. Also, we've never really preached the gospel, so a lot of sincere Christians live in a give up, try harder cycle. They try, try, try for a while, then they know they can't measure up on their own to God's standard, and they give up and they come back. Your pastor's probably seen that a million times. So we haven't really discipled people. What's your Bible say? Let's go back to this broadcaster that said, we live in the Laodicean age of the church. Well, in my Bible, when Jesus addresses the Laodicean church in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, he refers to himself as what? The ruler of God's creation. I rule, he says. I reign. Jesus says to his disciples, all authority except Tuesdays and Thursdays. Right? Right? All authority except when there's an election. All authority except when the offering's low. All authority except when my wife's not looking. Really? All authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. All. Either he reigns or he does not. He is Lord of all or Lord not at all. And so what has happened is men... Your male leadership in this culture, I used to believe this was rhinos and liberals and ACLU establishments. The truth of the matter is, 
The masculine leadership of your country in this civilization, in this era, is a mass failure. It is an epic fail. The men do not lead anywhere. You ever seen the movie Cinderella Man and Russell Crowe's character refuses to take welfare? Now billionaires show up at the Congress with their business plans for a handout. This happens everywhere. There is no real masculine leadership. And there is a systemic breakdown of this across the culture. Now the problem, here's the bad news, that will not be corrected overnight. There are a lot of leaders in churches like this, homeschooling communities like Amy and I are a part of, that they will, they will eventually get to the point that God will send them to correct these errors, but they're not ready largely yet. They're not. And that means in the meantime, we're going to have to develop some of our leaders like your pastor does with his Worldview Academy. You're going to have to develop your leaders. University of Iowa football program, year in and year out, no matter how terrible Ken O'Keefe's offense is, year in and year out, and can I get an amen on that? <laughs> year in and year out, defensively, they're great. Despite the fact they can't recruit the best players in the country, they're not in a state that produces great players, what do they do? They develop these players. They take guys like Carl Klug, who nobody wanted, and turn them into NFL draft picks four years later. Consistently, we've seen them in their strength and conditioning program take young men, redshirt them, take them away. Another form of discipleship. And they prepare them for when they're going to be ready to take the field. And they show up either too skinny or too fat. And you see them three years later at media day, and you're like, holy cow. Where did this kid come from? He looks like he's ready to ultimate fight. And that's why they go out year in and year out and beat a bunch of programs who dramatically out-recruit them. Institutions like yours here are going to need to do this for the next generation, this exact approach. Because these sort of gut level, here I am like Martin Luther, here I am, Lord, I can do no other, may God have mercy on my soul, largely those kind of leaders in your male ranks do not exist in this culture. They don't. So you're going to have to bandage a few up. You have to coach them up. You have to develop some talent, get them to play above their skill set. One plants, another waters, and then God gives the increase. It's what you're going to need to do. And try to hold the line as long as you can for when that next generation that is ready to take over so that they can play offense and no more defense. And the way you will do that is stop giving in to the culture. How do we win? A lot of Christians don't know. What does victory look like? A lot of Christians don't know. What is the purpose of government? A lot of Christians don't know. And that's why if you come tonight, I'm going to spend some time answering some of those questions for you. Because we have an opportunity. Tonight we're going to answer a question. How now shall we caucus? Because you have a unique opportunity here. You ever looked at a map of ancient Israel? I'll leave you with this. You ever looked at a map of ancient Israel? This little landlocked country that when you look at a map has really no geographical significance except for one thing. Every nation in the Fertile Crescent during its time period had to go through Israel in order to do business with one another. One empire couldn't get to the other. Why is the Valley of Megiddo the place, the road where more wars have been fought than any place else in human history? This is why. Because one king can't relate or get to another without, in that region where civilization really, was, really was, was headquartered at this time, one civilization couldn't get to another without going through Israel at that time. We are here in Iowa. Do you know what the most traveled road in America is? Interstate 80. Within a three or four hour drive of, central, of, of, of a centered point, central point in Iowa, you can get to how many different major metropolitan areas? We just so happen... Now listen, I don't believe in coincidence, only providence. We just so happened, therefore, to be the state that gets to go first in selecting the next commander-in-chief? That's an awful eerie coincidence, don't you think? That means, you know, we don't decide who the president is, but we often decide who it won't be. We're sort of a winnowing fork in the process, if you will. Although the last few cycles, let's face it, our aim hasn't exactly been true. And so here's what we need to do. The candidates that are going to come here, including even the one who's going to come tonight, they are not where we need them to be. They are not. 
They are not. Doesn't mean they're not better, and in some cases, some of all of them, to some degree or another, well, all but one, to some degree or another, would be better. Some would be more better than others. But I doubt that's going to be their, I doubt that's their campaign slogan. We're better than the others. Right? I once had a friend of mine who owns his own farm. He's a lobbyist down at the state house. And I said, hey, if, if, if you had, he's a pumpkin farmer. And I said, you know, the two peop, there's two pumpkin farms in town. And people come there and they want to get a hayride. And you don't offer one and the other one doesn't offer one. What do you think happens? And he said, well, I guess they'll probably just choose the pumpkin farm that has something else they like. I said, no, they don't. That's not capitalism, brother. Someone else is going to start a pumpkin farm with a hayride and put you two out of business. That's how this works. Yet we don't do that with our candidates. Have you noticed that? Well, this is all we've got. That's because that's all you did. Ever heard of a primary? Ever heard of a caucus? This is why they're there. They're not there to find the winner. Oh my gosh, I puke in my mouth when I hear that from people. <laughs> Give me the winner. Most of the biggest winners end up being the biggest losers. Because of what it takes to get all that money and who they get it from. I don't know. I may not be the most morally upright dude in the world, but I'm just sort of thinking that if a guy's campaign is primarily funded by casino pimps, he's probably not going to take a lot of tough moral stands. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> I'm not, I don't have to be a Socrates to figure that out, right, Bill and Ted? Pretty easy one to figure that one out. Now, if you're a little older, they used to say it, hey, you know, you can tell a lot. In my generation, we say you are who you roll with. Or it's, you can tell a lot about a man by the friends he has and the company he keeps. Or maybe the enemies he makes. So there's people that might be more better than others. But what you're looking for is somebody good. Or somebody who could be good. Somebody who could be good. Because here's what we also don't want to do. We don't want to take a little flickering light. This is a great temptation for my, of mine. And this is where God has to take me aside all the time and say, you know, I didn't do that with you. And I'm, I'm, not, and I'm still not doing that with you. And this is where there's a little flicker of light. And if it's not a blazing inferno, a burning bush, we squash it. That's not good enough. Let's not do that either. Let's not either do better or good enough. Let's not do either one of those two things. Well, better is good enough or that's not good enough. Somebody who could be good who maybe on everything won't get everything right, but on one or two really important things will challenge the system. Because here's where we're at. This is a football game. In this last election, we got the ball back. We had a goal line stand. They were about to go in for the winning touchdown. Game over. We had a goal line stand. But you know what happens when you get the ball back on a goal line stand? Where's the ball at? It's on your goal line. End zone is 99 yards that way. Now, we might throw a 99-yard touchdown pass. How many of those, though, have there ever been? Not many. And I doubt, given our lack of obedience, God would give us the grace for something like that. So we're probably going to have to start moving the ball, to quote the great prophet Hank Stram, matriculating the ball a little bit down the field here. We need a big first down. We're not going to hit a 99-yard touchdown pass in this election. We're not. The infrastructure's not there. The candidates that we need aren't there to do that. But if, we're, if we do the right thing, if we don't look at this emotionally, if we hold them to God's standard and not the Obama standard or the McCain standard or the Romney standard, I've been on conference calls and email exchanges with national re religious right leaders I respect, and here's all I hear. No more McCain's and we don't want Romney. That's not a standard. So uh, we want somebody who's better than the worst president we've ever had and the most liberal governor ever. Not a standard. What's good? And we need them to tell us what is good. Show us good. To paraphrase what one of the apostles says to Jesus, show us good and then we will be satisfied. Show us good. So you're looking for the candidate that's going to give you a big first down. You've got to get some breathing room. You need like a 15-yard completion over the middle here. That's probably the best you're going to get. Unless God gives us more grace than we probably deserve. Amen. 
And he might. Who knows? You know, if we go for a big first down and don't play, and we, you know, I love this. I get defeated a little bit less, and I call that a win. That's one of my favorites, too. Well, you got to do this incrementally, Steve. You're right. I suppose they could incrementally dismember me, but I still end up dead. If you get nothing else tonight, pagans are silly. Let's just leave you with that tonight, all right? And their arguments are silly, and they're even dumber when we verbalize them for them. So we've got to find the one that will give us a big first down so we can get some breathing room, some time, you know? We can open up the playbook a little bit because we're not back on our one-yard line. Some of these folks aren't going to do that. They're not. A few might. But let me tell you when they won't. They won't if you get emotional. They won't if you swoon. You won't if they stand up and say, Jesus is my favorite philosopher, and that's all they've got to say. They won't if you tell them, I'm just looking for someone that can beat Obama. Iron sharpens iron. You are their accountability group. Hold them to a higher standard than that. You're actually hurting them when you don't. Do not treat this like your favorite sports team. Yeah, go team GOP, rah, rah. Go conservative. Hold them to the standard. And if they love God, you know what they will do? They will strive for it. So how do we hold them to that standard? What are the questions we need to ask? What are the buzzwords and the keywords we need to be looking for? What are the compromises that we've done wrong and accepted that in this next era of cultural engagement, we've got to figure out? We're going to answer those questions if you come tonight. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you.